like me, you look forward to summer. I, I hated school growing up, and so about this time of year, I started getting really excited. I started really looking forward to what was coming, and I got very, very hopeful and excited that summer was almost here. And we need hope, don't we? Hope is the thing that sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and achieves the impossible, according to Helen Keller. Sometimes we have things that we're looking forward to, and they seem like they're just going to be here someday, and we're not sure when exactly that's going to be. And Proverbs 13, 12 tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And so some of us may be looking for something, hoping for something, and yet it's, it's a long way off. Anybody in that boat today? I know that I've been working on a doctorate forever and a day, it seems like. I can't wait to cross that finish line. Some of us are in a similar boat. And you know, we're going to be turning in our Bibles to Luke, the 21st chapter, uh, beginning in verse 29. And as we do that, let's think about the people that Jesus came on the earth to be with, the nation of Israel. They were a nation that had hopes. And they were long-standing hopes, and they were hopes that almost seemed as if they'd never come. And they wanted the return of the Messiah, they wanted a new kingdom, they wanted political freedom, and it just seemed like those things would never come in their lives. And amazingly, amazingly, when Jesus was literally standing in front of the people, so many of them missed it. Israel missed what they were looking for, they'd been waiting and waiting and waiting and even though they'd been looking forward, their hope was delayed and they didn't see it because they weren't looking in the way that God wants them to be looking. And in Luke 21, Jesus was stirring his disciples as well. He was saying, there's some hopes, there's some things out there that you need to look forward to and there's some ways of looking forward to them. He told them about some signs and what the right way to look forward to the things that he had for them was. And we need to listen to those words of Jesus today. Or we run the danger of the people of Israel of having the answer with us and missing it. So turn with me to Luke 21, beginning in chapter, or pardon me, verse 29. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And so Jesus spoke to his disciples, the people who were listening, and he said, look to the fig tree. And what he was really saying is, hey, pay attention to this, because they would have immediately identified with the symbol of a fig tree as being, representing the people of Israel. And Luke, because he was writing to a wider audience, he was writing to Romans, also says, and, and all the trees. And so what, what's meant by that, what Jesus was saying in this passage is, hey, pay attention. Not just you, you Hebrews, but hey, all of you guys, all of us, we need to pay attention to what's being said because there are some signs coming. There are some things that will come on the earth that will point to something else, and we need to pay attention to them because they're important. And the sign is, when these things sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near, and he used that illustration of summer to represent a new season, a new thing that was coming on the earth. And what do we think of when we think of summer? Well, if you're like me, you might think of rest. 
You might think of a, of a nice chair on the beach. You might think of summer reading. You might think of relaxing. You might think of a pool of lemonade. I don't know. But typically in our culture, we think about laying back, relaxing a little bit, enjoying ourselves. And the truth of the matter is there's nothing wrong with rest, and rest in the right place is appropriate and needed for the person of God. But we can't allow a moment of rest, the right kind of rest, to become a permanent state in our lives. Because when Jesus was talking about summer, he really wasn't talking about a time when everybody would relax. You see, he lived in an agrarian society, and when people thought about summer in an agrarian society, they didn't think about a deck chair, they thought about a garden implement. They thought about having to get out in the fields and cultivate and make things go and make things work so that when it came time for harvest, they would have a good, strong harvest. And I'd like to submit today that what we do in summer will determine what our harvest is. Now, Jesus was also telling his disciples that there were some neat things that were coming. There were some big things that were coming, bigger even than what they expected. And we look towards the promises of God, and, and we may be waiting for a house, for getting married, for going cancer-free, being healed of something, for a relationship, for our finances to come into better order, organization, for a business deal, for an educational goal, maybe even a weight goal. I mean, we can just draw the line, right, and just write on there what we're waiting for, what we believe God has promised to us. And the disciples felt that God had promised something to them. They felt that Jesus, because when they looked at him, they said, here's our king, was going to be like a checker piece, and all he had to do was get to the other side of the board, and they would add that other checker, and they'd king him, right? And they thought that God's promises was just that, and Jesus said, no, no, you don't completely understand my promises. They're so much bigger. They're so much larger than what you think, and even what you're holding on to. My promises are bigger. And the disciples had no idea how big. And so in chapter 21, Jesus starts telling them, here's some big things that are coming. You need to look for these signs because there's some great things that are going to happen on the earth when these things start happening. And the signs were false teachers, wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, persecutions. He said there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Nation will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Is that not a little bit bigger than the idea of the national king that the disciples were thinking about? When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is is drawing near. That's what Jesus said. And you know, we can get caught up as we look at the signs, and we can try to parse that and discern that, and we can look to this TV personality or that one, and we can try to figure out who the Antichrist is. And we can try to figure out when this time is coming on the earth. But the truth is, the church today should be on high alert, because nobody knows the hour or the moment when Jesus will return. And that's been true ever since he was taken up into heaven. He could come back any time. And so we have to realize that even though Jesus was talking about these times and these signs, that we can be caught looking at that so intently and we can be lulled into a false sense of security. We need to be ready. And I believe that that's part of what Jesus was saying to his disciples. Because something happened when Jesus lived and died and was resurrected. There was a change in the very universe, and we came into a time that we call the end times. And I know that sometimes we think, when will that happen? And sometimes we, we try to figure out if we're in them now. And the truth of the matter is, with the pouring out of the Spirit on all people, we entered the end times. We've been in them for the life of the church. We are in the end days. Jesus Christ could come anytime. No one knows the moment or the hour. And God's Spirit has been poured out, and you and I have it today, and Christ's return is imminent. Anytime, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's a couple minutes, or whether it's a million years from now, all times are relative to God. We need to be ready.
We need to be ready. And he said that we need to be ready because there is a kingdom on this earth, a kingdom coming, a kingdom on this earth. He talked about the kingdom of God, Jesus did. Very clear example of that is found in Matthew 13. And the 13th chapter of Matthew is dense with parables, story after story after story that helps us understand what is this kingdom that Jesus is talking about. And so we have the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, the hidden treasure, the extremely valuable or the, or the pearl of great price, the uh, parable of the net and the fish that are caught. And what we learn when we, when we shake all these things down and pull the pieces out is that the kingdom of God First is a hidden kingdom. It can be right beside us and we can somehow miss it. And we see that. We see that in the life of Jesus. Here he is right in front of the religious leaders, the people of the day. And they've been looking for him and they can't see him. So the kingdom of God is a hidden kingdom. And the kingdom of God is also a very, very costly kingdom. It's worth everything we have and it costs us everything we have. And third, we can know that the kingdom of God is a higher reality. We look around and so often we, we believe that what we're in touch with, what we see is the sum of reality, but Jesus was saying, no, there is a kingdom and it's breaking forth in the world and it's, it's here right now and we need to get a hold of that kingdom. There is a bigger thing than me becoming the king of Israel. I will be coming in the clouds and glory because I'm so much more than what you Think about me. My promises are so much bigger. They're so much greater than what you can even imagine. And that's what the kingdom of God is like. And finally, the kingdom of God is close. Luke 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus is responding to the Pharisees. And they ask when the kingdom would come. And he says, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And I love the writings of C.S. Lewis, the Chronicles of Narnia, particularly. I hope everybody's read them. If you haven't, then understand that Narnia is a whole other world, and people move from our world into this whole other world. And it's infinitely distant. There is no way anybody can ever get there on their own power. They can't get there on their own strength. There's just nothing that anyone can do to get to Narnia infinitely distant, and yet it's as close as opening the door of your closet. It's as close as stepping onto a terminal at a train station. It's as close as grasping hands and saying, God, help me get there. They're all parables. They're all allegories, wonderful books. Read them if you, want, if you, if you can. And Chronicles of Narnia help us think about the kingdom of God in a different way. It's just like that we can be in the kingdom of God. It's as quick as, as reaching out to Jesus and saying, help me. I want you in my life. I want to be in your kingdom. And yet it's so far away that we can never work our way there. We can never do it on our own. Because Jesus was actually the embodiment of the kingdom of God and the fulfillment of all the hopes and all the dreams of the nation of Israel. He was physically present again with the, with the leaders and, and people just missed it. And the disciples missed it because even though the kingdom was breaking forth in their midst and the fig tree, if you will, was budding, they couldn't see it. They didn't understand the season and they didn't do the work that they needed to do to come into the kingdom. Not the disciples necessarily, but the people outside of. And what we read, Jesus goes on to say, hey, my words will never pass away. And so this kingdom, this thing that I'm talking about, this, this hope I'm going to come into the world, that's going to happen. My words will never pass away. You know, if you and I said that, hey, my words, they're never going to pass away, then that would be the height of egotism, wouldn't it? Who was Jesus to say that my words will never pass away? We read in the Gospel of John, John 1.1, in ein hologos, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Who was Jesus Christ? He was the author of creation. He was one with God. He was the one who wrote the beginning of the story. He's the one who has written the end of the story, and he is the one who fulfills the pieces of the story that we go through. He is the beginning, the end. He is the goal towards which all is aimed. Jesus was a whole lot bigger than a national hero. Jesus was the very creator of the earth, and because of that, his words will never pass away, and we can trust what he says. But it's easy to lose sight of that in the day-to-day, in the, the busyness and the business of our morning-to-evening routines. And he said, truly, I'll tell you, this generation will not pass away until these things happen. And, and that's a little bit difficult because if we read it at face value and we think, well, he must be talking to these people he's listening to, well, obviously they're not with us now. And so has these things happened? Have, have they happened? But when we look at the word generation, which is there, there's really two other meanings. And one of them is that Jesus was talking about a future period of time. And it would happen in a lifespan, all of these events that he talks about in, in Luke 21, coming up to the verses that we're reading. They would happen in one generation of people, beginning to end. And who knows when that might happen. There was another way of looking at that, and that generation actually could also mean a people, and what he was referring to was the people of Israel, and that Israel as a nation, as a people, would not pass away from the face of the earth before he came back, that he would sustain them, that they would be a part of the story. And you know, we can look at that in a number of ways, and we can try to figure out exactly when these things are going to happen, or we can simply understand that Jesus Christ has already poured out his spirit and that what he's saying in these verses are not something for us one day to maybe, you know, if we start seeing this, then we we should pick up the Bible and try to figure out what to do. But what he's saying to us is a plan for us right here and right now. And Christ promised that he'd come again. He promised that his kingdom will fill all the earth and not be a dominion over everything but will become a blessing and a joy and a source of freedom. I mean, we celebrate those who died to give us our freedom. The coming of Christ will bring ultimate freedom to the entire earth. That's the hope we look forward to. Coming of light and hope of the maker of the whole world putting all things right. And some of you who follow me on Facebook or are friends with me on Facebook would know that I've been watching the Lord of the Rings movies with my girls. They're finally old enough for us to sit down and and watch them and Uh, you may know of the story in The Hobbit where the protagonists go into a forest called Mirkwood. And in Mirkwood, Mirkwood is a forest that once was, was light and happy and airy, but something has happened and it's become dark and it's become oppressive and it's become the place where when people enter it, everything in that forest is trying to draw them away from their purpose and their path and leave them to die out in the woods, lost and friendless. And we run the danger if we don't keep our goal firmly fixed in front of us to get sidetracked as we go through life. We run the danger of missing God's promises because we're lost and we're going down a rabbit trail when we should be aiming right down his path. We have to be careful not to get sidetracked. We have to be careful that we don't get off the path. Because there is a real God, but we also have a real enemy who wants to prevent us from achieving God's ends in our lives. There is a real church, and the church has a real mission. And Jesus is talking a little bit about the end of that mission in these verses. And the question is, how will we spend our season of summer? How will we spend this time before he returns? Will we spend it at ease and slumber, or will we spend it on task doing the work that he tells us to do so that we can inherit the harvest that he has for each and every one of us? Jesus goes on to say, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. And what are carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life? 
Well, we could go into details, but they're sin. That's all Jesus means is don't get trapped up into things that are, are sinful. And sin is what happens when we take our eyes off the path, when we take our eyes off the prize. Sin is what happens when Moses is on the mountain and there's fire and there's smoke and he's meeting with God and God's giving him the Ten Commandments and the people in the camp, even though they can see that, have gotten distracted and they're making a fire and in the fire they're casting gold and they're making a calf to bow down to. Sin is when we miss the mark, when we turn from the direction that God has us, when we get off the path. And we might not be actively involved in carousing drunkenness or the anxieties of life, but all of us have things in this world that are trying to lead us off that path. And we don't have to name those. If we have the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit will tell us what that means for us. Because sin is not a four-letter word. In our culture, we don't want to deal with sin. We don't like to talk about it. We're afraid to brand someone, alienate someone, or offend someone. We have a, a high ego and a great sense of personal fulfillment, and we don't want to talk about sin. But we can't ignore away the reality that there is sin in our lives sometimes, in our culture, and in this world, it's just a fact of being in this world, this dark forest, if you will, that we're trying to find the way through. And the way that we enter God's kingdom is not to ignore sin in our chair, but to overcome sin through doing the things that Jesus told us to do. It's to meet it on the field of war and vanquish its power over us through the word of God, the blood of Christ, and our faithful obedience to God's spirit. Those who are passive to sin do not inherit the kingdom of God. And they don't inherit it because of their own inactivity. They don't oppose the things that they need to oppose. Because remember, what we do in summer determines our harvest. And sin is anything that stands between us and God. It is missing the mark of the high call. And when I was at Oral Roberts University, one of the professors there, his name is Dr. Tom Matthew, the dean of the seminary, would talk about sin in terms of a story. And the story is that there was a couple in bed, and this is a true story. I don't know where he got it. He was from India, so could be overseas, could be here. But this couple was in bed, along with their 15-foot Burmese python. And one night... I don't know if the lady rolled over on it. I don't know if it decided it was going to get a midnight snack, but it didn't want to go to the refrigerator, and instead it just started coiling around her. Well, when she started screaming and woke her husband up, her husband came to her help, and he found that he was pinned by the snake as well. And somehow they got an arm out and got the phone. They called 911, and the police and fire and all of that showed up and got this snake off this couple. And, and Dr. Matthew has the ability to tell that story in ways that will rivet you. I can't do even justice to the story. But he always ends by saying, you've got to get the snake out of your bed. Talking about sin. And I'd like to suggest that Jesus is talking in those kinds of terms when he's talking about avoiding these things. But I would think instead of needing to get the snake out of our bed, what he would be saying is, Let's not get into the bed where the snakes are to start with. Let's not get into those places that are going to create opportunities for sin to begin growing in our lives. Because sin feels good to start with. People don't start sinning and doing things that are going to pull them off the path with God because it feels bad. They do it because they think it's going to fulfill the need they have. They, they think it's going to make them feel better. They think it's going to help them through this time. They'll just take this one momentary thing. I'm tired of fighting. I just need to sit for a minute. I just need to rest for a moment. And it's just enough time to get their eyes off the path and get lost in the maze of that thing, which is trying to pull them down. And Jesus says, don't let it happen because... It will prevent us from coming into the promises that he has for us. 
It doesn't mean that he's going to withhold those promises from us. I mean, what would be worse, having a promise delayed from us and delayed from us, or having the promise show up at a time when we couldn't accept it and have it pass us by forever? That's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, there are promises that are going to come into your life. You've got to be ready to get them. You've got to be ready to get a hold of them. You've got to be ready to grasp them. What would happen today if you were promoted at work and you did not have the skills or the ability to do that job? What would happen today if you were challenged beyond your strength in some task that you were called to do? What would happen if somebody, some relationship and you know what that is, whatever relationship, what, what if that relationship came back into your life today, positive, negative, or otherwise, and you did not have the growth and the strength inside to deal with that relationship in the appropriate way? And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, be ready. Don't fall asleep. Don't get drawn away. There is an incredible promise. There's some little promises, and we hold on to them tight, but there's a really, really big one coming. Be ready for it. Be ready for it. And you know, that really big one, the most incredible thing that's ever going to happen to any of us, when we stand in God's presence, when we are embraced with these arms like the father uh, in the prodigal son that Pastor Bill preached about last week, when we, when we have the fullness of joy in our lives in ways that we have just never experienced it, when we have that moment beyond all moments, it will make all of the vigilance and work that we do well worth it. But isn't it funny? Isn't it funny? And isn't it like the enemy of our souls to take that moment, which represents the highest joy, the highest hope of all human beings, and turn it into something that is a gotcha or a terror? And so people outside the church, instead of saying, well, the church... They're looking forward to the most wonderful thing on the face of the planet. No, what they say is, oh, well, the church, all they want to do is tell you, hey, turn or you're going to burn, right? The enemy turns what's the greatest positives in our life into the greatest negatives. And heaven is for real. And not only is it for real, it is our greatest hope. It's not a pie in the sky by and by. It's not something we just might do, and it's certainly not something we need to be in fear of. It is something we need to be so possessed of as a goal that we will not let it go no matter what comes. And we have to make no mistake that there may be a delay, there may be a distance between when God gives a promise and when he fulfills it, but if God makes the promise, the promise will come. For better, for worse, we cannot run from God's future. And I'm not suggesting that people have no ability to go forward. I'm suggesting that as we go forward, God has a, pu a future for us that's going to become certain. And that can be either the greatest positive or it can close over us like a trap, which is what Jesus' words are. And if it becomes a trap, then we're in trouble. Because it's a trap we cannot flee, and it's a trap we cannot avoid. We will all face a time where our promises are coming to us, and we can either accept it or they have caught us in a state of unreadiness. The only way we can do something with that trap is when we overcome it. Because we'll stand before Christ either in victory or defeat on the day that we stand before him. We will see all of his promises for us come into our lives and we will either be ready to embrace them or we will have to see them pass us by. And that's our decision. And the decisions made in that summer season as to whether we do the work that Jesus tells us to do or whether we find ourselves in a state of stupor and slumber. Some of you know a lot more about Special Forces Hell Week than I do. I've done a little bit of reading on Navy SEALs Hell Week, and if you're aware of it, the Navy SEALs training could be one of the most arduous processes a human being can possibly go through on the earth. 
For an entire week, they get four hours of sleep. They're subjected to intense cold, to wetness, to sand, to uh, hard labor, and the whole week, they're pushed to the uttermost of their limits. Over 70% of candidates drop during the first phase of SEAL training. And the whole time that these people are going through this intensely grueling ordeal, their superiors are ready to welcome them back to a nice, warm hotel room, give them a fantastic shower. If they will only walk up, get up out of whatever they're in, walk up and ring a bell. And when they ring that bell, they'll hand them donuts. They've been starved for a week. They'll give them something to drink. They'll put a blanket on them. They'll let them go get a shower, have a nice night's sleep, and then they'll put them on a bus to go home. And the people who give up decide that they're either too cold, too sandy, too sore, or too wet to go on. It's their minds that give up and not their bodies. The people who make it are the ones who say, I've got one goal, and it doesn't matter what stands between me and that goal, and that is to be a Navy SEAL. It doesn't matter what ups and downs. It doesn't matter what they put me through. It doesn't matter how sandy, how wet, how cold. It doesn't matter. I've got one goal. I've got one focus, and I'm staying on that one goal and that one focus, and that is exactly what Christ is saying to do in the Scripture. Do we want to inherit the promises of God? He says, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Only the single focused make it through hell week, not the physically strongest, not those who were voted in high school most likely to make it into the Navy SEAL program. Only the single focused, and that's what it takes for us to make it to Christ's ultimate goal for our lives, is to remain on target, to remain on focus, to remain singly-minded going after him in this dark and obscuring world that wants to turn us. And how do we do that? Well, we don't do it by picking ourselves up by our bootstraps. We do it, as Zechariah 4, 6 says, by the Spirit of God, not by individual might and power, but by the Spirit of God, that is how we stay on focus, because it is natural for us being in this world to want to take that rest, and we need places where we lay back a little bit, and there's a give and take, but that rest, that, that stepping aside can never pull us off our focus, and the only way that we can stay there is through the outpoured Spirit that Jesus promised to his church, not through our own personal willpower. And as we cling to that, and as we walk with that, we gain the ability to watch and pray, as Jesus told us to do. And in the book of Matthew, Jesus is, has this same idea that, that he's, he's giving to his disciples, and he tells another parable that's not in the book of Luke, and it's the parables of 10 young ladies, 10 virgins who are going to a wedding, and they... Some of them, five of them have their oil, oil flask full so their lamp will last all night and some of them don't. And that's an illustration of this point. We have to make sure that our oil flasks are full. We have to make sure that that's the spirit which the oil represents is present and strong in our life and we're vitally connected there. So we have the ability to do what Jesus is telling us to do which is watch and pray which is also what he finishes that parable of those, those 10 young women with. And so we're to watch and we're to pray. That's, that's the work that we're to do in the summertime. It's not going door to door and knocking and seeing how many people will accept Jesus. It's, it's, it's not any of the, the disciplines that we might put ourselves through. Those are all good. Those are all handy. They, they help us and they grow us. But the two things that Jesus told us to do to make it through the summer season, the season that we're in, where we're waiting for those promises of God, those two things are to watch and to pray. And what does watch mean? Watch means, well, literally to look at or observe attentively, but you knew that already. There's an archaic use of the term uh, from the Old English, which, uh, which means to remain awake for the purpose of a religious observance. And, you know, I guess there's just nothing that Jesus said that we should do that we haven't made some kind of religious formalized ritual out of. But 
It's that meaning, that old English meaning that we got to get a hold of to remain awake because watching, the original idea of watching was, was the military or the household thing where somebody stayed ever vigilant to make sure the enemy didn't come into the camp, to make sure that if the house was being uh, held ready for its owner to come back, that they didn't come back and find the doors locked and have to break a window to get in or something like that. It was the person who remained vigilant, who remained focused on the task, even though there didn't seem to be all that much going on in the meantime. And so we don't watch, as Christ was telling us to watch from our armchair, the way we watch a television. No, we watch as if we were on sentry duty. We watch to protect our families, to protect our relationships, to protect our homes, to protect ourselves from the onslaught of those things that would draw us away from God's plan. And we watch for the signs of his coming and, and the things that he's doing in the world and the work of the Spirit. Those are the things that we watch for. It's our duty. It's our first general order, if you will, as a Christian. And that's the work we're called to in the summer. And when we watch for the promises, we are ready for them when they arrive. But we might still be unprepared to handle them if we don't also pray. So we watch to be prepared when they come, and we pray so that we can be prepared to, to grasp a hold of them. And many of the ladies read Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline, last year. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. He also wrote a book on prayer. Make a great summer read. Also highly recommended. Many other spiritual classics on prayer. Uh, my wife is reading Brother Lawrence's Practice of the Presence of God. Uh, there's, there's others. Prayer is obviously just a fundamental discipline of Christianity. And we have to be careful when we start thinking about prayer, not to make it an academic task or not to make it just something we cross off our summer reading list to do. Because we don't need to be seminary professors. We don't need to be ordained ministers to pray. All we need to do is to be able to reach out to Jesus Christ because that's all that prayer is. Brother Lawrence, in the practice of the presence of God, the fourth conversation, and Heather posted this on Facebook, for those of you who follow her, so you already know this, but I'll read it anyway, says that the most excellent method of going to God was doing our common business without any view of pleasing men. And as far as we were capable, purely for the love of God. Great, it, it is great delusion to think that the times of prayer often ought to, ought to differ from other times. Prayer was nothing else but a sense of the presence of God, his, his soul being at that time insensible to anything but divine love. And I really believe that this captures the essence of the kind of prayer that Jesus is talking about as our work in this season as we wait for his promises. Prayer is not a formalized ritual that we use to keep God boxed up over there while we go about our daily routine. It is the invitation of God into our day-to-day -day lives, be it ever so mundane or ever so exalted. It is asking God, God, be a part of what I'm doing today. Help me. Stay with me. And it's through the process of praying that God points out those things that we need to separate ourselves from. It's through that process of being in communion with him that we, we grow spiritually, that we learn things. And it's through that process that we become who he needs us to be to inherit his, pro his promises. Because we, we think of verses like, I go to prepare a place for you. And we think, okay, well, Jesus is up in heaven somewhere building me a mansion, right? And so he's up there, and I'm down here, and I've got to do some work during the summer. And, and maybe if I do enough work during the summer, I'll be good enough to get through the gates, but there'll be that Peter thing, and they might make a joke out of it. But after I get through the gates, then I'll get to my mansion, and then I'll see Jesus. And that's not prayer. And that's not what Jesus is talking about here. What he's saying is, hey, there's a time, there's an end time. My kingdom's coming. My kingdom's here now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. You're going to see me. But not only is that happening, I want you to stay in communion with me. 
as you go about your day to day, as you're, you're going through the, the plotting of, of, of nine to five, boy, the kids are, are doing this or, or this is going on at work. When you're going through that, stay connected to me. Because I am, I'm building a place, there is an, something that is unimaginable, and you can't even conceive of how it's going to be to see me again, but I haven't set up a field goal out there in the, in, in, in the clouds, and I'm not concerned if you can kick the football from here over that field goal, what I want you to do is stay connected with me during this time. Don't run off, don't go somewhere else, stay with me, and I'll make sure that when that time comes, you'll be ready if you'll just hang on to me through it. Watch, stay vigilant, don't get lost, stay on the path, and pray, stay connected to me. I love you. I created you. You're my children, my sons, my daughters. I love you more than you love yourself. I love you more than your parents on earth love you. Stay connected to me. Because there's a day coming and it exceeds anything that you can even imagine. And I want you to be ready for it. It's not a test that I'm trying to see if I can get you to fail. It's a day that I want to celebrate with you, and I don't want anything to stand in the way of that celebration. Because sometimes the biggest wins in our lives come at times that we're just totally not expecting it. In 1665, the Great Plague was ravaging Europe. And the universities, everything was shut down. And there was a student at the University of Cambridge. His name was Isaac Newton. And he had just finished four years, and he still had another four years or something. I guess he was getting equivalent of doctorate. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it worked back then. But he got sent home from school for plague. And if Isaac Newton had, had been like me, I would have thought, well, I get to go home for a little while. I think maybe I'll... Kick back. Plague's going on. I've had four years of grueling study. I think it's time to relax. I think I'll have some lemonade, maybe take a swim. Whenever they get things going again, I'll go back to school. But do you know what Isaac Newton did? He was actually home 18 months. They call it his big summer. I'm not sure why that is. But in that 18 months, his big summer, Isaac Newton invented a new form of mathematics, calculus. He calculated a new way of seeing the, seeing the universe through three, three new laws of motion, including the, and, and, and formulated the universal law of gravitation. And he totally reformed and, and revitalized the, the field of optics by understanding that sunlight could be split into spectrums and did all kinds of work. And so if Isaac Newton had gone and had his lemonade instead of his tea, when he saw the apple fall, if he had not been focused, if he had not been persevering, I'm not saying he worked himself half to death, but if he had not been on task, today's world would be a different world. Jesus Christ is calling us to stay on task, to stay on mission because he wants us to change the world. He wants the world that he comes back to greet and to welcome to be a different world than it would be if you and I get lost off the path. And that is why he tells us to watch and pray. It doesn't matter where life takes us. If we will stay focused on our mission, watching and praying, we will be ready for the promises when they come, away, come our way. We'll be ready for our master when he returns, and we will be effective for his kingdom in the meantime. Because it's not how hard we work in summer, but how vigilant we are to the calling and election of Jesus Christ in our lives. Ultimately, we want God's promises, and we want to go to heaven. And that's not that pie-in-the-sky place. It's our goal. It's our target. It's the reason for us to be vigilant. We want to go, and we want to take as many people as we can with us on that journey. Jesus understood how wonderful that end was. He understood how powerful it was to have that kind of goal. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we read that he was the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and he went to the cross. Why? For the joy set before him. 
He went to the cross because he knew that what he was going towards was so much higher and so much greater than the pain and the shame and the trouble that he would walk through on the way there. He had an idea. He had this passionate vision of what God wanted, what that promise really meant. And that's the kind of vision that we need to have. We have to apprehend the incredible vision that God has for our future and grab it and hold it single-mindedly and stay in vital connection with Jesus Christ on the way. The movie, The Endless Summer, talks about some surfers who try to stay in summer. They go all around the world, wherever it's warm, and they surf. And for a lot of us, that's kind of our image of what summer is, right? If we could just relax, hang out, man, catch a wave, that would be like the perfect summer. And it captures something that's elemental to humanity. But ultimately, it tells a lie. And the lie is this, that we can have that kind of joy on this earth, that we can have a perpetual endless summer. What it is, it's a longing for heaven. And there is a place where we will experience that kind of joy, but it's not here. I'm not saying we shouldn't ever look for joyous things, but if we set our hearts on the things of this earth, we'll miss this earth. But if we set our hearts on the things of heaven, we'll find that we get earth thrown in. That's what C.S. Lewis said. And We've got to keep our eyes on the prize. We've got to keep our eyes set on heaven. I had the absolutely unbelievable honor of attending uh, Lorraine Nadekarni's funeral. Lorraine Nadekarni, some of you know Deepak and Lorraine. I believe that she was a captain in the Navy, was buried with full honors, at Arlington National Cemetery on Friday, and it was one of the most powerful, moving experiences that I have ever participated in. She was an absolutely fantastic individual, and she deserved the honor she got, and she was honored by our country as a fallen hero, as well she should have been. But as moving as that was, and it was powerfully moving, I think that I was even more greatly moved when our prayer team went to Deepak and Lorraine's house just maybe a week before she passed away. And in that time, as we were praying, I heard or sensed in my soul the sound of trumpets playing, a clear ringing, and I could see as if there were mountains. And I don't know if that was just me or if God was saying something. I, I don't know. But it made me think of the line in the Lord of the Rings movie, have you ever been called home by the clear ringing of silver trumpets? And Lorraine was a great hero for our nation, but she was also an incredibly strong Christian. And I have no doubt whatsoever where Lorraine is today. I believe with all my heart that she is in the presence of Jesus Christ, that she is experiencing what this verse gives us as a hope directly right now. And again, I don't know if those trumpets calling were in my heart or in my, my head or if God was in some way saying something through that. But I want one day to figuratively cross over that river and hear the trumpets sound for me as I enter the gates of heaven. Not a bugle call of taps which was played in that funeral service when they put her body in the ground of a soldier's last going home, but the clear ring of silver trumpets calling her home to be with her Lord forever and ever and ever. And that is why we have to watch and pray. So when those trumpets sound for us, we enter the joy because we have prepared ourselves for it. C.S. Lewis wrote, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, 
The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. Jesus has made a promise. There is a day that we will inherit the real thing for which our hearts so desperately long, the entry, the full entry into his kingdom, which is a now kingdom and a future kingdom at the same time. When we will step through the bounds that limit us to the promises of this world and come into the fullness of all the promises of God. And when that happens, when that happens, all shall be well. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, as Julian Norwich said in a vision of Jesus Christ. And so today, Jesus is, has given us the opportunity to work so that we might have that opportunity to reap a harvest. And the work that we're to do is to watch and to pray. And the challenge is very simple. If you will commit your heart and your life to be vigilant on the task that Christ has called us to, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and to remain alert and watch. If you will commit to watch and not fall into slumber and stupor and lose your way off the path, then I invite you, stand with me. We're going to pray that the Spirit of the Lord will strengthen our resolve, even in times when it's difficult to watch. And so if you will commit to do what Jesus said and watch, I invite you to stand right now. And if you will likewise commit to keep seeking Christ in the darkness when it's hard, when you're confused, when maybe even you don't fully believe anymore and you just need him to somehow break through that darkness, if you'll commit to pray, then stand up as well for that. And we want to pray with you because we need God's spirit to walk that path. path.